What is up, ladies and gentlemen? Welcome back to the Quartz That's Out podcast. Once again, I'm Josh Shavanoff. As always, welcome by the one and only man of the hour. Too sweet to be sour, Angel Ortega. There is a lot of stuff we need to talk about this week. Obviously, UFC 293 and uh, Sean Strickland lighting the world on fire on Saturday. That's the main topic of discussion this week. But uh, we have a bunch of other stuff to discuss. As always, we're brought to you by two fantastic sponsors of the show, Rogue Energy and Elixir. Rogue Energy, long-time sponsor of the show. Keep me feel up, keep me going throughout my day. They can help you as well. With code sound off for 10% off, elixir.com, the exact opposite. Can they get you really high with their Delta 8, 9, 10 AGC products? Again, a code sound off at checkout for both of those. Rogue Energy and Elixir code sound off. 10% off of both. Last Saturday night from the Cradles Bank Arena in Sydney, Australia. Angel, he did it. He fucking did it. He did it. Sean Strickland fucking did it. We are in the upside down. Sean Strickland is the UFC middleweight champion. Uh, not only did he beat Israel Adesanya, I think most people would have uh, said there is a world where you know Sean, Sean could win. Fighting is unique. I don't think anybody saw a world where Sean Strickland would win 49-46 on the judges' scorecards, become the first man to knock down uh, Israel Adesanya, and so on and so forth. Angel, uh, I watched everyone with you. We are both. It was we were in awe. Of this performance, uh, speechless coming out of it. Now that you had a couple of days to kind of let it sit and, and simmer, uh, what's your what do you think about it, man? Fuck, man. I mean, this like like I told you earlier before we started. I'm like, this is how this 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 fight game shit is, man. On that night, you, you can get these number of little moments throughout the card, and this was obviously the pinnacle of it. You know, especially because you know it's a title fight, men of that upset it had everything right all the elements to make fighting great uh, a unique story an interesting guy and also josh i don't even think about this dude but americans on top of the mma world again josh we got john jones's champ we got sean o'malley's champ that's because and... america is always on top angel usa usa <laughs> no i'm sorry go ahead it's sean strickland's champ you know i mean it, it's kind of crazy I, I had mentioned to you this a while ago i'm like dude Right now, you know, the, the the Russians are, you know, they're dominating the Brazilians for a little while. We obviously had the three African kings there for a minute. And uh, now, you know, we got the three Americans on top of the UFC, you know. And, it's, and I'll say, interestingly enough, man, they might be, out of all the champs, they might be the biggest stars. I mean, uh, Sean Amanda, obviously, kind of his whole success and rise we've, we've seen throughout the past few years. I see John... You know, they're, 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 nothing has to be said there. I mean, it's you know, obviously the the status of of, of him is, is well known. And uh, Sean Strickland, I mean, he has had a, developed and grown his own popularity uh, with his whole uh, persona. So, uh, you know, to kind of rally back and talk about a uh, fight night itself. Yeah, dude, other shock. I mean, the first round, I mean, it's, it's set the tone for the night. And... Uh, like you said, we were all we, we were all oh shit, you know, off oh, everybody, everybody. <laughs> there was no one there when that first round happened who didn't have a insane reaction. Um, to talk a little bit about what we said pre fight, look, I did not think this was going to happen. I don't think you thought it was going to happen. Not a lot of people thought was thought this was going to happen. I did believe that there was a path to victory for Sean. I just didn't think it was going to work. Uh, it fucking worked. You got to give credit where credit's due, man. He was able to uh, essentially. I guess neutralize is he's probably the best way to neutralize his game. Allow him to not do what he's most comfortable with and uh, take those tools away and win and win because he was able to take away all his offense and put Izzy on the back foot and he stuck with him with glue man. I've always said this. I think if someone's gonna be, uh, I thought if people were gonna start beating Izzy and give Izzy a difficult time, it was gonna be like that. Just be on him, cut the cage, be defensively sound, and, and he fucking did that, man. And he even spoke about how. He wasn't even quite sure if he thought he was going to win this and all that, and he, that he had some doubts in him. And I, 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 there were just certain things we probably did overlook that we didn't. And, and like I say, this happens all the time in fights. Um, to an extent, there's some that you, I don't think this is this would necessarily you could equate to. But I, I mentioned to you, I'm like, this is there's Eric Nixick and those guys at Extreme Couture. Uh, and I don't know if Nixick was all was there for all these other three fights before him, but this is fourth shot at this fight. Brad Tavares, Extreme Couture guy, Marvin Vittori, another Extreme Couture guy, or trains out of Extreme Couture. Uh, obviously Marvin having two fights. 
Brad being uh, one of the first, I think, wrecked middleweights to fight Izzy, and now Sean, and uh, well, shit, dude, uh, fourth time's the charm to get it done, or I guess third time's the charm to get it done. And uh, I, it, was, it was just amazing, man. You know, you got to credit where credit is due. Obviously, I'm, I'm an easy fan. I'm an easy fan. I'll say it. But uh, it took me a little while to process it because it was such a – it's funny because uh, Oscar Oscar Willis from the Mac Life said it last week. I think it was last week. I can't remember. But it, he said something along the line that it's like it was one of those where – you know, a week from now, we'll all be talking about it. We'll all be like in shock about it. Well, yeah, you know, we're we're not even a week removed. We're only what is it now? Just maybe three, four days, whatever. And we still are kind of going through that now. We're, we're getting through it, you know. Yeah, yeah. I mean, look, dude. I have a lot of. I have personally like really a lot of thoughts coming out of this one, man. Um, Particularly, like, I, I'm going to make a really weird comparison. I don't know, like, how many people will kind of get it. But, like, Sean Strickland fucking was like, he's like James Tony, man. I mean, he was hitting the shoulder roll out there. And uh, they were talking a lot about how he was doing a lot of sparring in the build-up to this. Um, like, 20 like twenty rounds, like they were saying. Like, 20 rounds a day sometimes. And uh, I was like, dude, look, this motherfucker really is James Tony, man. Like, nothing but sparring and nothing just – very much a boxer hitting the shoulder roll. Like, it was just, it was crazy out there, man. And like you went in and said, like, I thought there was, we kind of said, like, on the show last week, there is an avenue and a path to victory for Sean Strickland. But the issue is, is will he stay, you know, will he stay to the game plan? Will he stay dedicated? And will he do the things that he needs to do? I didn't think he'd be able to be flawless for 25 minutes. I thought that at the very least, like, there could be moments for him to have success. And then I figured there'd be pockets and windows where he'd ha- find success, I didn't think he'd be able to be perfect. And I thought he would have needed to be perfect to beat Izzy for 25 minutes. But he, you know, he was. He, he was he was damn near perfect. Now, I gave Izzy two rounds. You know, I gave him rounds two and three. Um, and even outside of the knockdown in round one, like, I, I mean, Angel, I, round one was going Izzy's way until the knockdown in the last 30 seconds, right? Like, I'm not crazy. Like I, I felt the same way, yeah. Like, yeah. If I can remember right. Yeah, it was definitely a very competitive first three rounds. But what shocked me was the ease at which, like, Sean easily just took over the fight after round, you know, after round three. Like, round three was competitive. You know, I gave it I gave it to Izzy. If he would have given it to Sean, I know that was the popular opinion online. I have no problem with that. Um, but after that round, you know, you saw Eric Nixick go over and give Sean Strickland, like, a, a pep talk. And Eric Nix said afterwards that Sean told him, like, he really needed that pep talk at that time. But his after that, like, Sean, he, he, he knew it was a very competitive fight at that moment, and he wasn't letting the belt go, you know. Um, and in that fifth round, that fifth round, the image of Sean Strickland walking forward, talking shit at Israel Adesan, just yelling at him. And Izzy, you know, I don't think Izzy looked off on Saturday, Angel. A lot of people are saying he looked off. I think he looked, like, less sharp, definitely a little bit, but I don't think he would have, you know. I'm happy to point his direction because I actually had some comments to make about that. Yeah, go, okay, so what, I'm going to go on Andrew quickly then. Uh, I, I think he looked – I don't think he looked off, honestly. I think he looked, like, slightly less sharp after that first round, but I, you know, I don't think that Sean Strickland and Adrian Adesanya did anything majorly different than what they were going to do already. Mm-hmm. Um, and sometimes you just wake up and you're flat. Uh, but the only thing that I thought was off was Israel Adesanya, who is a dog. Like, people hate him, but he's been to the depths. We've seen it against Kevin Gaston. We've seen it against Alex Bahia. He didn't look like he was willing to go to those depths against Sean Strickland, and especially in that fifth round whenever he was, you know, he really needed to turn on the gas and just say, fuck it and go for it. And A, he didn't. And B, whenever Sean Strickland was running, literally walking forward, talking shit to him, one of the reasons why we love Max Holloway so much is for his moment of walking forward, talk shit with him. But the reason why that worked so well was because Ricardo Lamas also met him right there in the middle. You know what I mean? Israel Adesanya and Sean could have had that moment. Israel Adesanya decided to walk back. You know what I mean? Um, that's just that's just the one thing I noticed. I thought, like, man, he's a guy that's always – he is willing to die in there. But uh, he just did not see – after that first round, it looked like he didn't want to be there. 
That's where I thought things kind of changed. What do you, what do you think? What do you kind of make of all the talk of him being off or whatever it may be? I mean, there's a lot of factors that I think we'll never truly know. One thing that I did feel like, I felt like this is one of the first times ever in Izzy's career when I felt like there was a disconnect in the corner, Josh. Like there was no sort of urgency. He was just kind of there when they went to the corners. It felt like the, the adjustments were thrown out there did make sense, but they weren't. They were just that. Like they, they, they didn't have more, uh, emphasis on maybe specific things or, or kind of really trying to get through him, I think, at times and kind of like have this kind of sense of like urgency. Uh, uh, and also I, I think he did and didn't underestimate Sean at times. I think maybe they believe they could come in here and I'm not going to say they didn't game plan. They, def- they definitely must have, but I felt like they thought that Izzy was just going to be able to go out there and do his thing. You know what I mean? Which it's kind of a feeling I got on that night. Obviously, that's just an assumption. I don't know. Um, as far as being off on that night, I, I think to an extent that first round did was definitely like a, it was hard to recover from. And there's a there's this thing where fighters kind of like stick to a game plan, and they kind of don't know how to get it away from that. It's it's funny because I think like Raul Ross has talked about it, which obviously he's a young kid, he's learning, and he mentioned that he's like, yeah, on that night, I'm not gonna lie to you, I we had a game plan, it wasn't going right, and I didn't know how to change. I didn't know how to adjust. You know, I didn't know what to do because I stuck doing the same thing. And this happens all the time. Spider talks about, about how they, they kind of have that situation come up and, and to talk about, and, and look, people mention that Izzy had some stuff going on in his personal life and all that. Like I said, at the end of the day, you got to get credit to Sean Strickland. I think no matter what Sean did shut down Izzy's tools, took away what he's good at. And I don't think Izzy's been figured out, but it's something that, uh, the guys on Morning Combat mentioned. It's like at this point in time, you gotta think, you know, there's so much footage and, uh, information now out there on Izzy and patterns you can see, you know, that, that's one thing you never, we never really talk about, dude. When you're champ, there's a reason we say, you know, you're defending the, there's the whole phrase defending the title is quite literally, you're defending, you're fending off people from the title because people are coming they're preparing mm. for you. You are no, are you, I, it's going to sound weird. You are still preparing for your opponent, but you are no longer preparing your, for your opponent like how they are preparing for you. Because mm-hmm. everybody has their eye on you. So I think that obviously played a big factor. Um, you know, like I said, you have to give all the credit to Sean. I mean, it wasn't all just, you know, outside factors. This isn't that. I mean, Sean did what he had to do. He, he used his tools and, and made the best of them. Um, to talk a little bit about the division, though, Josh, this is actually this is a big thing for me. Uh, I am going to hurt some people with this one. Uh, I do think the Sean Strickland era won't be very long. I'm, I'm oh. going to put that out there now. Asshole. I, I, I see a maximum of maybe two title defenses if things go the right way. Maybe one at, you know. Yeah. But, and I'm just going to be blatantly honest. I, I think this belt in the next year, year and a half, could change into four hands. And, that's not, and, I, and the reason I'm saying that is because, for one, you know, Israel Adesanya is still in the picture. Sean Strickland is our current champ, obviously. I think that, I mean, I'll honestly kind of a cop out here, but that's our first change, right? Change one, so I only need three more changes. But still, that's still a lot. I see. Yeah. Uh, Drickus Duplicy is ready in the wings. <laughs> I think I'm, but <laughs> it doesn't matter. Uh, how's about Shemayev and Paul Costa are about to fight? Josh, I mean, shit. If the UFC ever would, instead <laughs> of Shemayev any better, right? Yeah. If, if Hazmat is to be, Paula Costa coming up here soon in Abu Dhabi in October. It's almost like, and, 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 and there was, Dana's clearly having some issues with Drikas. It almost seems like the perfect slide in, right? Mm-hmm. Uh, yeah, dude. I I'm, mean, I'm not saying they're going to yeah. do it because Dana already handed a rematch, which, funny enough, Josh, I, I'm, sometimes I'm kind of, I feel like a lot of times I'm down, but for one time, I'm kind of, I'm not. You know, I feel like I'm actually like fully not, not for it. I, I actually, I was telling you, I, I'm, I've, I've kind of be down right now, and, and you and you told me Robert Whitaker kind of shut this idea down, but I feel like right now it actually makes the most most sense in my opinion for this mm-hmm. match because I'm like, who wants it more? And what I'm talking yeah. about is, is I want Israel Adesanya, Robert Whitaker, the trilogy. You know, it's I feel like Robert got a lifeline with this, and the whole division got a little uh, got a lifeline with this. Is something Josh is telling me, but for me, especially Robert Whitaker, who just suffered a, I think his biggest loss in his middle boy career. Same with Izzy because of the way he did lose and who he lost to. It's like, dude, who wants it more? You know, who wants mm-hmm. it now? Because Robert gets a shot at beating this guy. He's beaten twice. 
You know, Izzy's fighting a guy he's already beat twice, but he's also in a tough spot. And he's fighting a hungry guy who made the last out hard. I want to see who wants it more, goddamn. Yeah, no, I see your point. And and Whitaker, um, Whitaker was asked about that, about a potential Izzy third fight, and he was like, like, look, I'll fight anybody, but, like, there's not a whole lot of point. I could fight somebody else in the top five or in the top ten versus fighting Izzy for the third time for no title. You know what I mean? And I get his reasoning. Um, I would personally like to see that fight. <laughs> Sad thing is, homie doesn't know he ain't fighting for a title soon. <laughs> Yeah, I mean, he's not he's not going to get a title shot. Well, I mean, look, it depends on how the division goes, right? Like, I think that, um, obviously, we'll have to see how things go with this potential rematch. I know Dana, dude, Dana White is just, man, he's something else, man. I saw he, he confirmed the rematch in the post by Presser, and then, like, it, after he did the Dana White Contender Series last night, and he, like, did a whole rant about the media for saying that he did, he said that he was going to do the rematch, saying that he never said that he was going to do the rematch. So <laughs> what? apparently, not, yeah. So apparently, Dana said that the rematch. He never said that. So he said that actually, what he he said what we said was that he said that the rematch was totally going to happen. But actually, he said we're going to have to see how this goes. So uh, I guess we're now we're now he backtracked and we're going to see how it goes. So he he probably did think about Abu Dhabi coming up in hindsight. I'm, I I'm, I bet you 100 percent he did. Yeah, exactly. You know, because um, you're because te- you're telling me, regardless if it's Paul or Shamaya, if you're telling me that lead up wouldn't be great too. Yeah, I mean, well, here's the thing: is like I gotta be honest, dude. I see people hating the rematch, but I really don't think there's a single way. There's a bad avenue for the UFC to take here. Like, you can do a high profile rematch where, like, now these guys have a, are going to have an even much better rivalry. You know what I mean? Like, it's still compelling. How will Izzy bounce back? Because not only – because he lost to Bahia, but this is a much different circumstance. You know what I mean? Mm-hmm. Um, this was a fight he lost very cl- clearly and evenly last when he lost to Bahia. Some people were complaining about the stoppage, but then he was up on the cards. You can do that. You can do, like you mentioned, Paulo Costa because he had issues with Strickland. If if, if uh, he gets through Chemayev, if Chemayev gets through – Paulo Man. Costa, like, dude, Shamayev and Strickland? Dude, and are... you know what's funny? I'm down for Drake and Sean, too. I know they're not going to – it seems like they didn't want to do that for some reason, but I was – I'm, like, super down for that fight, too. Yeah. Like, I'm... It's the least It's the least likely option because – Which is Drake, insane. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. It's funny. It's the least likely option because Drake deserves the shot, but – that's the way it goes sometimes, man. I mean, I really hate, I really do hate to say it, but we, it, it, there's been more deserving guys of a title shot who have not gotten into Drikas, you know what I mean? So I think they're probably just hoping that people won't care about Drikas, and I think they're probably right. You uh, know what I mean? was, I was DTF for Drikas 2 plus C versus no, 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 yeah. I, I completely was, agree. I was DTF, dude. I was major DTF. Dude, I'm always down to fight when it comes to a guy like Drikas, you know? Like, I think that'd be an awesome... An awesome fight, but I just don't think I just don't, you know. I don't think they're gonna book it. I think it'd be it's the least like financially viable option because a guy like Drikas works as, as like a title challenger for a guy like Izzy, but he does not work as a title challenger for a guy like Sean. You know what I mean? I don't know. Because, Sean, Sean's kind of gotten some stardom right now, though. I mean, not only not... has, but it, it you got to have a good foil, and I don't think, and I think they know that Drikas does not work as a good foil for. Him. At least that's what I think. So. I also wonder what Izzy wants. Does he want to rematch? Did he, he didn't really say anything yet, has he? Still kind yeah. of all under wraps right now. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Yeah, I mean, look, it is uh, – we're going to have to go ahead and see, man. It, 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 there's a whole lot to go ahead and wait it out, I guess. But I do think it's interesting that, A, you know, Dana backtracked, and uh, now it just seems like things are more open. But I do think that uh, – I really do think that that Chael Sonnen hit the hit the nail on the head. He was like, "Yeah, not Drikas, not Izzy, or if they do Izzy, maybe they'll do Izzy, but it's gonna be Paulo Costa or or Hamza Chimaev. That That's probably, that's what I'm thinking too. Like, yeah, I mean, look, dude, and and it's all about fighting at the right time too. You know what I mean? Like, and those guys are literally fighting in three weeks, I believe. So, oh yeah, they're, the best, they're in the yeah. best position ever, dude. Because by the time early next year. Sean Strickland versus whoever, and dude, depending how the fight ends, right? Because you know, dude, Sean's insane. He'll do a fast turnaround. Yeah, these guys can fight in in January. And Hamza does like to do fast turnarounds too, sometimes. So we'll see. Shit, maybe even dude. Could you imagine December card? 
Sean Strickland, Paula Costa or slash Shamaya, you know, co-main, main event, whatever it would be. Probably main. Yeah. Um, but yeah, man, I think, I think we should go ahead and, um, move on a little bit to kind of the rest of the card. Obviously, one last thing I do want to go ahead and say on the internet, on the, uh, on the, uh, the main event, dude. Um, Izzy, I would not be surprised if Izzy takes time off. I don't know how you feel about this. I expect him to actually take time off. Well, um, you saw the thing that I sent you. DC, uh, DC tweeted out how many yeah. main, main of, yeah, uh, I'm trying to see if I have it here, but he's headlined UFC 236, 236 UFC 243, UFC 248, UFC 253, UFC 259, UFC 263, UFC 271, UFC 276, UFC 281, UFC 287, UFC 293. Like DC said, I think the champ deserves a little rest. He earned it. Yeah, and also the way he spoke at the post fight press conference, he didn't have a Ronda reaction or anything, but he did show up at the post fight press conference and said, "Yeah, I'm not going to talk, guys." Here's here's Eugene Behrman. So um, he doesn't. Maybe he just doesn't. Well, I mean, he doesn't like the media in general. That is also part of it. So I don't know. Um, yeah, I don't know. I expect him to do take time off though. I think that's probably. I wouldn't be surprised if that's why Dana shifted his conversation and shifted his tone. Honestly. Maybe um, maybe he spoke to him. Maybe he was like, ah, actually, yeah. Maybe he got some internal for, stuff, you know. Granted, yeah. Like I said, and and like we already talked, he had, like I said, he had some stuff potentially going out, like actually that we know of going on outside of Act On, in his personal life. But nevertheless, man, we we don't know this all for a fact. We don't know how the inner workings of his mind. We could all we could do is assume. But the guy seems to have like, and and, this, and obviously this applies to anybody, but. It's, it seems like Izzy knows himself very well. Mm. That's something I've learned from following him. Like, he understands himself. Like, he knows what he needs to do to function. He knows what he needs to do to succeed. He knows what he needs to do to motivate himself. He is no stranger to his own emotions. It's something that I've I've learned. Mm-hmm. Yeah, you're not wrong. He, he doesn't to, He doesn't yeah. suppress, you know? Whereas, uh, you could say, great, and everybody, everybody copes differently, man. I, I, I got to say, man, it's weird. You remember how Alexander Potosha afterwards, you know, uh, did that whole speech and he, and he, and he told his, his father who walked away out of his life and said, are you proud of me now? Afterwards, when Sean did that whole thing and said that, uh, you know, he's like, you know, my, my, uh, my upbringing and, and having my shitty dad and my alcoholic father really put me in this spot right now. It felt kind of like in an odd way, kind of similar to Pantoja's moment. Obviously not the same, right? That's what you're saying. But there was like some major coping there afterwards. That he was doing through like suppressing it and using it as fuel that I could definitely like. In an odd way, I could kind of relate to it. It's not the same extent, right? I've never been through anything like that, but I, I know how it is to like take something that is hard in your life and find ways to cope with it that are not very common, like he does. Yeah. Not to get it too much into my own personal life. No, no, I see what you're saying. I see what you're saying. Um, yeah, man, I do think we should move on a little bit. We spent about, like, 25 minutes on the main event, but I do think, uh... Deservingly, a, though. Yeah. Deservingly. D- uh, no, I completely agree. I'm happy we did spend the time on it. Um, but I think we should go ahead and move on, because that co event... Dude, Alexander Volkov, you want to talk about a guy who just... I mean... I've been here, Josh. I've yeah. been here. Dude, ever since that loss to Tom Aspinall a year and a half ago... Knock out Yarzinho in the first. Knock out Romanov in the first. Tied to Ivasa, and this one was a submission win in the second. Pure domination once again, dude. Volkov is just, he's hes in his prime right now. You know, he's a bad man. What do you think about his win? I'm not surprised, motherfuckers. <laughs> <laughs> no, I mean, this is what I expected. Uh, obviously, for a while now, even before that Tom Aspinall loss, we, he had kind of been experimenting, trying to do different things with the way, uh, new tattoos, right? Obviously, very technical for, for a big guy. Doesn't move very quick. Uh, weighs a lot. Has some ground capabilities. And like I said, I've always believed in Volkov. I, I think that maybe certain things go a different way. Maybe one or two losses don't happen. And he's right there for a title shot. And he, and I, I will always believe until the day he retires that he has the potential. It's just whether or not he can push through, get those big wins, and become actual UFC champ. Um, he's obviously in a tough spot in a hard division. 
Uh, and like I say, you got you got to look back. He gave he still gave a guy like Estrella on a good out, took him to distance, didn't lose to him. I'd say his worst loss in recent memory, in my opinion, was obviously the Curtis Blades one, which is a, and guy Chris Blades is a tough out for anybody. He's a guy who's also constantly improved. Uh, you, you know, to kind of like move a little bit from Volkov. I feel for Ty, man, but I just knew this was not a good matchup. He has potential to bounce back. He's young. Um, obviously didn't get knocked out in this one to get choked out, which I guess better than being finished. But still a tough one. Three losses in a row. He's one of those guys that I think, Josh, no matter how much he loses, he will always have stock and interest from the fans. Mm. Um, career-wise, obviously losing and health-wise is not good. You don't want to see that. But... I don't think this lowers his stock a lot at all. Mm-hmm. Yeah, no, I agree. I agree. For a guy like Tatu Vasa, like you mentioned, he's always going to be, he's always going to have that certain market. He's always going to have a certain level of uh, star power, and he's always going to have fans behind him. This loss does suck, but I don't, I mean, we can't say we didn't see it coming, man. Just a terrible matchup for him. Um, for Volkov, dude, like you mentioned, could potentially be one day champion. I mean, 34 years old. Three wins in a row. He's looking as good right now as he's ever looked in his UC career. Um, we'll have to see how it goes right, like, moving forward. But shit, dude, I mean, he is still, I still think he's still on the cusp. I think I think a fight with Aspinall, if they rematch that one future down the line, I think that would be interesting to see again. Um, I don't want to see the fight next, let me be clear. But, I mean, I'm just saying, like, I think that Volkov, that was just a bad night at the office for him. You know what I mean? I think he's hitting his prime right now. I think him against anybody ranked in front of him would be interesting. Now, he's fought most of those guys already. He already lost to Blades. He already lost to Aspinall. He already lost to God. I mean, shit, Josh. Uh, what, two of those guys might not even be in division a few months from now. No, you're not wrong. You're not wrong. You I mean, Stipe, Stipe and John, I don't think, are, are long for the division. So, But, yeah, dude, I mean, hey, we'll, we'll see what happens. I think Volgado, though, dominate win, was not surprised in the slightest. Um Getting the sub surprised me. Hitting the Ezekiel choke, dude. That was that was pretty sick. Shout out, shout out, Laura St. Going on commentator, uh, commentator. I believe she was the first one who noticed it too. Um, we didn't even well, mention Josh, it. Josh, I, I, I was on commentary at the house and called it out first. That's true. That's true. You you were you were a couple of drinks deep, but you did call out fucking. I called it way before Sanko. Yeah, you're right. You're right. So yeah, man. I mean, it was it was a damn impressive win. But uh, dude, in my opinion. Best fight of the card. It ended up being fight of the night as well. Deserving. Manel, yeah, Manel K defeating Felipe Dos Santos, unanimous decision, uh, 29 28. Just a banger, dude. I mean, these guys just get. Felipe Dos Santos was just non stop throwing. Uh, didn't land as much as I'd say Manel K, if I believe Manel still landed, ended up landing more strikes and also landed the harder ones. But, dude, this kid just came forward, had an incredible chin. It was just taking everything on him. What would you think about it, this fight? Look, I I knew it was gonna be a tough out for this kid, but he had nothing to lose. Mm-hmm. Uh, he was coming on short notice, like a week notice. Had to cut weight twice. Didn't get to fight on the contender. Got his opportunity on a pay per view on a main card. I mean, it was a best case scenario for him, and he got to showcase himself. It was one of those situations where he lost, but he still gained something out of it. And for Manel Cave, same thing. He still got to fight, not against the guy he wanted, but still got to put out a good performance. And obviously. The post-fight speech, which you guys have probably seen on Instagram slash Twitter, we don't got to repeat it on here because we're not trying to get demonetized or canceled. But Mm -hmm. I got to give him credit, though, Josh. He still wants that Kai Kara fight. I mean, there's a lot of guys who'd be like, well, I didn't get to fight Kai Kara or I didn't get to fight my my opponent. You know, I'll move on from it or whatever. You know, there's situations like that where a guy, you know, had uh, his opponent put out. They They got a guy who came in on short notice. But there's kind of no interest in kind of rekindling or kind of following up that fight afterwards. Uh, not in this scenario. If he doesn't fight him at some point, he'll go to his gym and, and, and spar him, Josh, eternally. You know? Mm. Which, this whole rivalry and everything is kind of selling itself right now. I mean, I, mean, I almost think you capitalize it and put these guys on a UFC fight night and, uh, and the fight has sold itself, man. Uh, yeah. No, they, this is like literally the first time in, in a long time where I, there's been like a flyweight fight that like has, that's, that's non-title. That I should say that has a lot of excitement behind it. Like, dude, Manel Cave and Kai Car France are like sworn enemies now. So it's like they got 
I'm happy to that fight. You know, you're, you remember I told you like a good like year, year and a half ago. I'm like, Josh, where the good rivalries at? Dude, we don't have this shit where guys can't even see each other. You know. Yeah. You know, I don't think this would be DC Jones, but I mean, at least at least it's getting me going. You know what I mean? At least I'm partially hard. Yeah. <laughs> um, look, man. Yeah, I mean, like you mentioned, he called him out in the crowd again. Said a word I can't repeat. Which, by the way, dude, like I, Menel Cape said it. Uh, Charlie Radke said it in his post fight speech. I really thought they were going for the hat trick, dude. I thought with Israel Adesanya, and I said it to you before the man. I'm like, dude, with Izzy and Sean Strickland guaranteed in the main event. The hat trick is guaranteed. They're totally yeah. going to say it. They didn't end up saying it, but I, I, you know, who knows what would have happened if Izzy won. Um, but anyways, yeah, I mean, they got to book Manel Cape versus Kai Car France too. Uh, they they got to book those two next. Um, it's going to be an absolute banger, a perfect rivalry. Um, and then for for Felipe Dos Santos, I mean, this kid, dude. I mean, so impressed. I mean, and he didn't. He didn't get the win, but damn, dude, he was competitive. You know, only 22 years old. He's get, 23 years old. He's going to get better. You know, very, very, uh, very, very entertained by his debut, man. And that gas tank was crazy. Like, I, I love dudes like that. Like, if you're not going to go out there and win, at the very least, you're going out there and you're doing everything possible that you possibly can. Just throwing nonstop punches, putting the activity forward, moving forward. Love to see it. Even though we got rocked multiple times in that one. Neither got finished in the first, so. Uh, damn impressive stuff from both. Uh, speaking of finishes, these are both going to be very quick recaps, Angel. Uh, <laughs> Justin Taffa went out there and got eye poked once again by Austin Lane. However, he proceeded to waste no time coming back from this eye poke, getting a mm-hmm. knockout win in a minute and 22 seconds. Uh, you know, four fight, you know, unbeaten streak for him. What did you think about this one? Oh, man, dude, it's hilarious. I'm like, there's no way this just happened again. I mean, it, it was literally that a GTA meme. Oh, shit, here we go again, you know? But I guess that I guess that set up uh, Toffa, and he was like, you just think I'm, uh, you pissed him off, and he, he was like, I'm going to take care of business now, man. We're not going to wait any longer anymore. Mm-hmm. I, I had some hope for Austin, and I still do. I, I think we'll rally back. Um, like, it is what it is. I know this was a possible outcome. Like like I said, Josh, it's unranked heavyweight fighting. Uh, anything could fucking happen. Mm-hmm. No, you're not wrong. You're not wrong. And uh yeah, dude, I was not surprised at all at that this way that this one went the way that it did. It's pretty much what I expected. I lost I like Austin Lane. Um but he is a uh you know he he's one of those guys that like I think five years ago never would have I mean we know for a fact five years ago we never would have signed he didn't get signed five years ago whenever they he tried the first time around. But I mean like just the talent level in the UC and, and especially like some of the the lower echelon, I feel like it's gotten so much lower, which is why he was even in that fight in the first place. Um, yeah, man, good for Justin Toff, I guess. Was not surprised at all. Uh, Tyson Pedro, though, you know, in, in the press conference earlier uh, earlier in the week, you know, Angel Anson Turkelodge, he said that Tyson Pedro, you know, he's got to ask his wife what it's like to meet the pleasure man. Jesus. And, uh, and on Saturday night, Tyson Pedro, he met the pleasure man, all right. Uh, he, I think I thought Turkelodge's wife asked, you know, <laughs> she she's gonna find out what it's like to taste the Australian, you know. Uh, anyways, yeah, man, just pure dominance, uh, knockout win inside of two minutes. What do you have to say for this one, man? I mean, like like I said, I, I thought that you know Anton Turkelodge, he had faced two really tough guys going into this one. Wasn't really sure of his skill level. Uh, we know we know a bit more now. Yeah, no, definitely. I think it was a perfect bounce back for Tyson Pedro, obviously knowing that he had those kind of health issues going on, and uh, we knew what he's capable of, and and kind of how he's still kind of trying to grow and develop and get better. Uh, it was a perfect rally back, man, and to do it in in Australia. I mean, how else would you want to do it? it? It was perfect. It was a perfect way to return into the win column. Um, we can't wait to see him again. Mm-hmm. For sure, man. Can't wait to see him back. And if he can, keep on improving. I mean, he's 31, but you got to keep in mind, I mean, he missed four years of his career. So, I mean, we'll see. Um, like, what his actual fight age is, you know what I mean? So, um, Same. A- yeah. Anyways, man, we'll go ahead and uh, keep it moving because the prelims, not a whole lot, admittedly, um, in terms of major, like, developments. But there were a couple of interesting fights, man. Which ones do you most want to talk about? Oh man, Josh, we gotta talk about Carlos Oberg, the man who probably should have been on the main card. 
didn't get to get showcased. One of the three they got to one of the three guys that did get to win at a, a city kickboxing gym. Uh, I mean, look, this is once again we didn't predict this one. This is kind of why I envisioned what I thought was going to happen. Not necessarily submission, but uh, you know, and he was on the back foot a fair bit, and he was able to to still put in some good work, man. Um, no, I mean, I mean, he's continuing to kind of build upon what he has been building on. Like I said, he did have that one pebble in the road with uh, Kenny Jiruku early on in his UFC tenure. Could have been ten and zero, nine and one, not a bad record by any means. Great record. Uh, I don't know what they'll do next with him. I, I think I don't know if he's ready necessarily for a ranked opponent yet, but I think he's right almost there. Give him another guy just outside of the top fifteen. Maybe running back with Kennedy and Jibuku. I know he's coming off a loss. I know that's a tough one. May I don't know. Kind of the it's not like the, it's not like we're unknown to do you know uh, uh, second fights where guys had a clear uh, victory. But granted, he yeah. like Carlos was winning that one early on. Ended up gassing Kennedy and then come rallying back and you know taking care of business. But just kind of a thought. Uh, like I said, I, I really don't know who you should give Carlos Burk and Olbert next. But in my opinion, I would personally like to see maybe another guy who's outside of 15. And then after that, give him a, give him a right guy. Mm-hmm. Yeah, man, you're not wrong. I don't know if exactly if he's ready for a ranked guy, but he's like on the verge. Um, if he's not going to get a ranked guy, he's got to get somebody in that 15 to 20 range. You know what I mean? Of just the guys that are kind of in that, that gray area. Um, it's going to be a weird shout. I don't know if you'll like it or not. I, I don't know. But, uh, I was thinking after watching that fight, because they even, I don't know if you remember this, they had like, you know, significant strikes per minute and they pulled up the leaderboard. Number one in the light heavyweight division is Carlos Olbert. Angel, do you remember who number two is? Was it, Dustin, was it my boy Dustin Jacoby? Dustin you? Jacoby, Angel, who uh, is ranked 15, one and two in his last three. I think Dustin Jacoby, he's currently unbooked. Dustin Jacoby versus Carlos Olbert, I think makes a lot of sense right now, man. Sounds like a banger, too, though. Yeah, it really does. I think that's I think that's a perfect fight to make. I mean, he's literally 15. He just got a win. You know what I mean? Like, let's fucking do it. Let's fucking go, man. You know, let's do it. Um, if but they may not book that one, if they don't, you know what I mean? Sure, I'm sure he'll get somebody in that 15 to 20 range. There's a good win over uh, Jung Dun on here. Um, we'll see what he does next. A lot of potential still. A lot of potential. Great striker. Seems that he's really kind of settled in. You know, um, in the UFC now. We'll see what happens. Um, Jimmy Malarkey picking up a win over John McDessey. Um, close fight, competitive fight for both there. Uh, sucks to see John McDessey lose any time. I always love seeing those kind of old veterans. And I remember he came out firing early, man. Like, he was looking good early. Um, and did not end up getting, up the, did not end up getting the win, though. Uh, Nash Red Hackbarath got a win. Uh, Keeper Crosby, who we kind of talked about last week, suffered a loss. <laughs> Coming in from Bellator. And hey, they August, started off hot, though. That fight started off hot. Yeah, it was a very entertaining fight, too. Um, and then, obviously, Char- we got we to gotta say it. Charles Radke defeating our boy Blood Diamond. Um, yeah, it is what it is out there. Because that one, admittedly, pretty much nobody talked about the, the fight itself. Everybody's talked about the post-fight that, that, that has to be the end of it, right? Like, there's no way they uh, run one more back, right? I would be shocked. <laughs> I would be shocked if they get blood. I mean, four or five deals are pretty standard. That may give him one more. Could you they imagine? Just might. Hey, dude, that, 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 you know, being friends with Izzy goes a long way. Being friends with the big boys goes a long way, you know? So, anyways, man. Um, any closing thoughts, UFC 293? Go ahead and rate the card for me out of 10, man. I know that sometimes we like to do this with the pay per views. Uh, what would you give this one? I it's seven, six and a half. Yeah, yeah. I mean, that's, I gotta be honest. Just, I'm gonna get. I'm gonna give this one a nine and a half, Angel. Really? Just yeah. Of the, I, just, is it because of what I think it is? The main event, yeah. I mean, I think I think Angel, dude. We're, I, I, you know, this card was not very good on paper, but like, dude, we're, we're talking. Gonna be, we're talking strictly the paper, right? Like strictly just yeah. the main card. Yeah. Uh, aftermath wise, I mean. You know, I just I just have a different grading scale, I guess. I just think like we're gonna be talking about up. that moment for like. And you're going to think of UFC 293 occasionally okay, for the rest well, of your life. Okay, well, when you ask me that, I think the whole card. So hold up. Let me let me think how I want to grade this. Like a, yeah, like an eight and a half. I'd yeah. say it's solid. 
And not I, I, like a nine would have needed a better co main event, if I'm being honest. Nine, yeah. even, for, even for a nine, I give it an eight and a half. Yeah. Fair enough, man. Fair enough. Um anyways, I think we should go ahead and move on because we do have we do have a fight card going down this weekend. It is one we've talked about a, a fair bit. It's UC Noche. It is uh Set to celebrate Mexican Independence Day, and they are choosing to do it in Las Vegas instead of Mexico. Uh, nor are they even going to. I mean, maybe maybe Vegas just has a much higher Mexican population than Mexican American population than I think. But I feel like there's a couple other candidates they could have gone to. But regardless, yeah, Mexican Independence Day going down in Nevada, uh, going down in Vegas in the main event. We got Alexa Grasso, Valentina Shevchenko. We know the story here in March. Grasso scored the submission win and then upset. Uh, Shevchenko was winning on the card before that. Shevchenko said that she's going to come in here. She's going to dominate for this rematch, Angel. Uh, what do you think about this one, man? Uh, very compelling fight. Very interested to see what you think about it. Oh, man. Wow. I mean, look, what I like about this fight is it's kind of like there's there's a this rivalry kind of developing, man, you know? Like slowly, uh, and if Shevchenko is, is able to get it done, man, potential trilogy at some point, I don't think we get it after this, but you know, down the road, um, uh, for Valentina, man, I think interestingly enough, and it, and we didn't even mention it about the last week's card, but I, like, uh, one of the things is, is that I was going to mention in that one was that, uh, I don't necessarily think the division lapped Izzy, but I think the gap that he once had in that division kind of is closing in a bit and it's gotten a lot tighter than what it used to be. Same thing for Valentina. I think for a while there, Valentina got to enjoy a lot, but we've seen like in the last two outs, even maybe they throw it a slightly, I want to say Jennifer, my obviously Jennifer, my had a moment in there finally took around. Uh, the division kind of, is, and, and, and still is. And we see with these gals coming in there, but that's real metaphor of Rose, even two out there on that category. The gap is beginning to close that once was there. You know, uh, mm-hmm. both AZ and Valentina don't get to enjoy all the advantages that they once had on their way up when they were cha- becoming champ, on their journey to become champ, and even in their early parts of their championship uh, tenure. Mm. And you got to give credit to Gross's team. Great game planning, great adjustments, very successful on the feet. I mean, we saw Shevchenko was taking the fight to the ground and finding a lot of success and, and began to win the fight uh, on the ground. I just, mm. I do think, man, it's still going to be hard. It's going to be competitive. But she did lose because of a mistake she made. She recognizes that. And knowing how dedicated Valentina Shevchenko is to this game and how much she loves it, I would, ex- I think, and I would expect her to come back and rally and win in this. Um, I don't think that there is this big gap between Alexa Grasso and Valentina. It's definitely going to still be a tough out. It, it's wild, man, because Grasso really did grow a lot. Um, I'm excited to see what she can do. I, I'm not going to lie. I think it, I still would be surprised if she won on the night of, but I'm, I want to see what she's going to do differently in this one, if, how what she's going to do against the, the takedowns, or maybe if Valentina has maybe – done some different things on the feet that she can come notice some patterns in, in Grosso's game and can adjust. Mm-hmm. Yeah, man. Um, I gotta be honest with you, Angel. I, I'm actually really conflicted going into this one. Um, I, I don't blame the, you. Yeah, I rewatched the fight yesterday. Uh, so it's very, very fresh in my mind. Um, yeah, Alexa Grosso had more success on the feet than what a lot of people remember. Uh, she also was very, very good at getting out from the bottom and being able to get back and put the fight in places where she can be competitive. And I think that's the biggest thing that gives me hope. That I'm seeing a lot of people are like, oh, you know, Valentina's just going to fuck her up. I, like, I saw some dude like made a highlight video, and they're like, oh, man, people forget how Valentina was winning the first fight. I'm like, no, people don't. People didn't forget. You know what I mean? Like, uh, people are like, oh, they're gonna f- she's just going to fuck her up. It's like, you know. Obviously, the spin is what caused her to lose the title, but she was having a, pet- a competitive fight with Alexa Grasso before that. Um, Alexa Grasso was able to get out from the bottom, especially whenever Valentina is able to try and she tries to move to the side, she tries to move to the top, tries to move to that cru- crucifix position, which she's been able to finish multiple fights with. Alexa Grasso, multiple times, found her way out from the bottom, got back to the feet, put the fight in a 
place where she can be competitive. I expect her to do that again. Um, and Angel, dude, I just I don't see a way that Mexico loses all four champions. I just don't see you know what I mean. You would have been all three champions. Excuse me. I just don't see it happening. I think that we're gonna go ahead and have and still on Saturday. I don't know why. I just got a weird feeling. I don't think she's going to – there's no fucking way she loses on Mexican Independence Day, is there? No way. I mean, I don't know, man. I don't know. <laughs> Look, I, I, went, I went the Valentina yeah. route. And granted, Josh, I've, I've told you my thing now. I'm sticking – I'm I'm not – I can't switch, man. I can't yeah. switch. You know what I mean? I just can't. Yeah, yeah, exactly. Um. Yeah, like, I, I don't know. I'm very conflicted about this fight, like – because for for a while I, I thought you know like oh Valentina is probably gonna by probably... the way either either result won't shock me like unless unless we're also dominant the only the only sin the only scenario the only situation well I'll be is a is a Grosso dominant win or he like she puts her out of there on the feet like that's the only scenario that would shock me mm-hmm. if Grosso is able to win maybe capitalize on another mistake and get a nice submission so be it okay I could see that Valentina comes back and has that y'all must have forgot moment. See it too. She dominates her. Same thing. You know, the only scenario that will surprise you is if Alexa Grasso absolutely dominates Shevchenko. Because mm-hmm. it's something that I just can't see happening. Yeah. No, I agree. I agree. Um, but yeah, dude. Like watching the watching the first fight back, like there were definitely a couple of things that like I forgot, and uh, it definitely made me think like, oh, you know, like Alexa, she may not win this one, man, but like she's gonna be competitive again. You know. Oh yeah. Um. Especially with with her team, with the improvements that she's making, because uh, I've said this many times now, um, she came into the UFC so young. I mean, she's thirty now, but she came into the UFC whenever she was twenty three. So, um, yeah, I mean, she was she was so young. So she's improving a lot. She's improved rapidly. Like I said, Valentina may she may win back the title. I won't be surprised if she does. Like I said, I'm like fifty one forty nine right now. You know what I mean? Like I'm. I'm siding with with Grasso, but for most of the builds of this fight, I've been thinking probably Shevchenko. Um, wouldn't be surprised if he goes the other direction. Would not be surprised if, if you know the bullet can regain her title. But I think Mexican Independence Day is a perfect storm, man. They made this card strictly for Grasso. Let's go, and I think she's going to go ahead and uh, retain her title. Um, yeah, man, this card. You know, there are a couple of of Mexican fighters. Uh, the co-main event does not have Mexican fighters, but it is a banger. But you know what uh, they will do, Josh? They will. They might fight like some Mexican fighters. That's you see, that's that's the way to put it. They may not be Mexican fighters, but they're gonna fight like the Mexicans. You know, Kevin Holland, big mouth, riding a two fight winning streak. Uh, Marco Chiesa and Santiago Ponce, and we have both been finished this year in 2023 alone, returning to take on the rapidly improving, rapidly becoming a star, Jack Della Maddalena out of Australia. Kind of fucked up they didn't put him on the Australia card, but... Right. Uh, whatever. He'll be back here. Because let's, let's be honest, they really could have got away with a co-main Ralph Rosa Jr., right? Like, they could have done it. Easily. But they didn't. <laughs> this is a poor guy. Gr- granted, though, Josh, we should yeah. say this card took a fuck ton of hits. It did. This card... You know, it was it was one of those ones that kind of just scheduled it like this was not originally on the schedule for 2023 anyway. Uh, so this kind of card has been kind of like makeshift together. But, yeah, they've taken a lot of hits. Kelvin Gastelum, obviously, is, I believe would have been the co-main event. They went through nine total changes, Josh, just to, like, give you a number. Yeah. Yeah. Nine total changes. It's rough, man. It's It's a rough card. It's definitely. Yeah. But anyways, we'll, we'll in the co-main event. What do you think about it, man? Uh, it is going to be an absolute banger. Jack Delamontelay, Kevin Holland, both extremely entertaining. Biggest test of Jack Delamontelay's career so far. Man, this is one where I've been conflicted, man. Because Kevin Holland, like I said, one, one issue they've had with Kevin Holland, I felt like there's a sort of – like after his last fight in his win over Michael Chiesa, he comes out and he's like, well, you know, I guess I might go to 185. Uh, what? You know, yeah. it just threw me off. So, and granted, he's taking another fight against a good, against a good guy, ranked. I almost like, dude, stay here. You're doing well. Um, look, he, he could, he might even win this fight. Uh, for Jack Maldonado, he has a tall task, quite literally. Uh, he's fighting Kevin Holland, who will have a side, a good, a decently, uh, big height advantage and even a range advantage. I think uh, Holland has like an 81 reach. 
I think you know, I'm looking at it now. Jack has the 73, so curious to see how he deals with that. Let's see Kevin Game on the feet. I don't know. In Jack's last out, people kind of had a, you know, we were all kind of hype on the Jack that I'm going to train. It was like, first finish, Peter Rodriguez, cool. Beats this Russian, cool. Danny Roberts, another victory. Randy Brown, okay. It's getting hot. Then Bazil Hafez comes in, eight, eight and three and one fighter. We don't know too much about him. He kind of gets signed. It gives kind of a good showing, man, which kind of put people on edge. It's like, wait, wait a second, you know? But you just got to put into context that Jack is fighting another guy. He was supposed to fight the week before. You know, there was, there was more to it. He was supposed to fight Josiah Harrell and not Basile Havzez. And Sean Brady is another. Like, he went through, like, three total opponent changes. There's a lot to it. Mm-hmm. But, Josh, I got a feeling, though. I think Kevin Hall is going to get it done, Josh. I think Big Mouse is going to get it done. I, I don't know why. I've had this gut feeling the whole week. I, I don't know. I'm just, I'm, I'm feeling it. I think he'll be able to find his range. I think he'll be able to get his striking flowing. If the fight does go to the ground, we know that Kevin Holland has a sick jiu-jitsu game, a, a, a black belt. I'm feeling, uh, decently confident about this one. Um, yeah. Um, I don't know what the betting odds are. Um, they, let me actually... they, should, they should be close. They're near even. I just looked at them. Okay, I was going to say. Yeah, that, that sounds about right. I'm going to take Kevin Holland, dude. <laughs> We're on the same boat, man. I'm, I, I'm yeah. happy. I'm happy I'm not alone. Like, Yeah. That last fight, and obviously the guy he was facing, um, <clears throat> let me rephrase, Jacques de la Madalena's last fight, and the guy he was facing, uh, Basil Hafez, does appear to be extremely talented, to his, to his you know credit. He seems to be a very talented guy, right? Um, that fight gave me a lot of pause. Um, and even if he did not, but even if he didn't take that fight, Kevin Holland is very, very long. He's much bigger and, uh, he's going to have a, in case you're curious, Angel, he, Kevin Holland is going to have an eight inch reach advantage in this fight. Eight inches. Um, and on the feet where Jack, De, that tends to be Jack De La Madalena's playhouse, man, it's going to be tough to try and, uh, you know, bridge that gap. And even if he does, Kevin Holland does have slick jujitsu. Uh, maybe Jack de la Madalena does have a fucking, you know, Habib Dagestani style wrestling game I just don't know about. But, uh, yeah. you know, I just think like styles make fights, man. And Jack de la Madalena is the real deal. But I don't think, you know, dude, trying to bridge an eight inch reach gap against one of the most, you know, creative strikers in the UFC. Now, I'm not going to say the best, but creative, I feel like, defines Kevin Holland to a fucking T, you know? Um, I just don't think it's going to work out well for him. I think Kevin Hall is going to get a big win here. He's feeling himself right now, man. Um, he seems he, he seems like he could go on a run, and I think he's going to get a big win here. So um, I'm glad we're on the same page, though. I, I was definitely interested to see how you thought about this fight. Hey, Jack um, has that nuclear option, though. I mean, I mean, we've seen the power, which is it's it's completely like you wouldn't. I don't look at Jack and I'm like, damn, this guy looks like he could fucking blast some guys, but he can't. Exactly. Exactly. Because he does have a whole lot of power in his hands, but will it matter against a guy of that caliber who is such uh, so good of a champ? So, anyways, man, uh, what do you think about the rest of the card here? Um, you know, some, some, you know. I mean, there's, there's one. Thing, there's <laughs> there's one. Know. We, we, we know you know who we got to talk yeah. about, Josh. We got to talk about yeah. Robert Rosas Jr. Who last time out? Look, we had it was I believe Raul was on the main card. We had a, it was that Izzy card. Um, that was earlier this year, wasn't it? Fuck. Right? Yeah. Yeah. God, yeah. So much has happened this year. Regardless, though, I remember talking about that Christian Rodriguez fight. I said I had talked about his potential path to victory and what could it be and, and what he could do to Raul. And he ended up doing that. I picked Raul for the hype. I was like, maybe he'll – I think maybe he could get it done. Let's see if you're that level kid. And I gave him the benefit of the doubt. Um, he has sent – you know, he lost that. I've, I've seen a lot of interviews. I've seen him talk about it. And he seems pretty mature about it. You know, he's obviously – We've seen he's been very busy training. We've seen him up in the middle of buttfuck nowhere. He don't know. Couldn't even tell you where he's at. I think he's in Kyrgyzstan. Funny enough where Valentina's from, right? Kyrgyzstan? Or originates mm-hmm. from? Uh, doing some stuff out there. I don't know. I don't know exactly what he was doing. I don't know exactly what he was training. Uh, he went down to Mexico for a bit. I know he was working with the guys down there. Obviously did some stuff. I know he was, uh, he went on to Brandon's podcast and talked about stuff there too. And, uh, 
Stick to a guy in Terrence Mitchell who was removed from fighting for quite a while. He's, for people who don't remember, he fought on that Ultimate Fighter season with all the – what was the the flyweight tournament or whatever they called it. He ended up losing his first time, the first fight to Kai Kara. 30 seconds in, finish. Go check it out on YouTube. I'm sure you'll find it. And then after that, he took a sizable break from fighting. He was scheduled to fight multiple times. Why these fights were canceled, I don't know. Just ended up happening. Number of reasons. Uh I just looked at one, Josh. It says here that literally Terry refused to enter the cage. So we might have to do some, we might have to do some research in that. Yeah, I think you got to do some fucking. But uh, Terry Butcher hadn't fought since 2018. Came back into fighting in 2023, really this year in February. Fought two guys in the in the in the Alaskan uh, regional scene. Was able to get two first round finishes. Comes in. At one uh, of one thirty-five, I think it was even on short notice to fight a guy in Cameron Simon. And look, Cameron Simon's a game fucking kid, dude. Young as well, twenty-two. Uh, has is a little bit older than Raul. I think they saw that. Like, look, we we gave a young guy this opponent as well, a guy whose game has experience, has fought some top opponents. <laughs> you know, maybe you know Raul sir needs to fight competitive guys. He's in the UFC. Guys who are tough. You know, let's see what he can do against this guy in Terrence Mitchell. So I think, Josh, I'm not saying it's a layup. It's definitely not. But they're still giving him fights that make sense. Hmm. Yeah, no, they are. They are. And this is a good matchup for him, man. This is a good matchup. Um, if the fight happens, who knows? Maybe maybe Blood will just won't, won't enter, enter the cage again. Who knows? <laughs> That's crazy that even happened, right? I, just, I would love to know the context. We, we, need, we need to do it. We'll do it afterwards. <laughs> Yeah, well, anyways, anyways, yeah, I mean, th- this card's pretty solid, man. I mean, Raul Rosas Jr. is by far um, the second, I mean, I guess, not second, excuse me, uh, third, like, biggest, like, high-profile fight on this card. Um, what do you mean, Josh? Tracy look, Cortez is on the early prelims, I mean. I mean, you know how big of a fan I am of Tracy Cortez, you know? Um She's definitely, and that this is her first fight in a long time. I want to say too. Yeah, she had a she had a lot going on, injuries, personal life, yada yada yada. Yeah, I mean, I remember she she you know, yeah, she fucking yeah, she's dude. She's fought once for every year of her UC career. She fought once in 2019 after getting the contender series. She fought once in 2021 to 2021 and once in 2022. Damn, man, Tracy, let's let's, let's get some. Activity going, but she's facing Jasmine Jazz Vicious, and that is not an easy out. So that's a tough um, out. Yeah, she looked game as fuck in her last set against Miranda Maverick. Dude, she hey, and and uh, she also beat. I also want to say she beat like uh, Kay Hansen too. But like, she's she's gotten some good wins. Like she's game as fuck. Like you can tell that she's not like the most athletic or maybe not like the most talented. But like, dude, she's game as fuck. Sticks to a game plan, and uh, gonna go ahead and give her give Tracy Cortez a tough fight back. Um, Roman Kopilov versus Josh Frumd. Should be a banger. Yeah. That should be a, an awesome fight. I'm excited to see the return of Lupi. I love Lupi. Lupita Godinez. Um, running a two fight winning streak. Um, game as fuck as well. You know, taking that, coming back to take on Elise Reed should be, should be a pretty competitive fight. Um, Daniel Zell Hooper is back in Chris Gilles and so this, is a, this is a smaller card and they've lost a lot of people. Uh, but yeah, man, it is, it is going to be fun. Should be a banger though. I think there's a lot of banger fights on this. Like I think guys will definitely show out for this one. Yeah, I agree. And do you know who's uh who's coming back on this one? Which is which is weird as fuck. Uh, I don't. I want to see if you'll. I, I'm assuming you don't. I guess you don't know then. Alex Reyes. Do you know who Alex Reyes is? I'm not blanking on this. <laughs> okay, Alex Reyes is, I believe, Dominic Reyes' brother, maybe. But even more than that, he got knocked out by uh, by Mike Perry years ago. UFC debut. Yes, six years ago, and he never fought again. This is his first fight since he got knocked out by Mike Perry on like super short notice. It's so random. What the fuck? Why now? I'm I'm trying to find it out right now. Actually, yeah, he had he had a spinal infection in 2018. He was told he may never walk again. And now he will return to the cage. He was supposed to come back earlier this year, but he withdrew from his fight. Both, to, or from one of them, and the other one, his opponent withdrew. 
Yeah, man. Is that not fucking crazy, man? Life is wild, man. Yeah, it really is. That's fucking crazy, man. That really, really is. Good for him, though. Good for him. And he's taking on a guy that is of his, you know, certain skill level. Um, in, uh, I believe, Charlie Campbell, 7-3, and 7-2, and two, excuse me, uh, formerly fought in Bellator a couple times. So, uh, hopefully, hoping the best for, for the boy Alex Reyes, man. Coming, coming back here, first fight in a long time. We'll see how it goes for him. But, anyways, man, um, I think we should go ahead and, uh, unless there's any fights you le- left to talk about, unless there's one I missed. I mean, any any last ones you want to go and highlight? I mean, I think that's it for the most part. I mean, there might be one or two people there, but I think they'll have highlights that I can mention next week. Mm-hmm. Yeah, for sure, man, for sure. Um, but I think we should go ahead and move on because we do have a fair bit of news. In fact, this news, Angel, it broke right before we started, uh... Basically, right before we started filming, Kayla Harrison has not been seen since the first loss of her career to Larissa Pachenko last November. Uh, obviously, we know the story there. Previously, had beaten Pachenko twice, lost the trilogy fight, major upset, upset of the year. However, she's been saying, you know, I want to come back. I want to get a good, I want to get one more fight. She's going to come back to face former Bellator champion Julia Budd at featherweight in November. I believe that is going to be their championship card as well. A um, couple of things, man. What do you think about this matchup? Is this the right one for Kayla, Kayla Harrison to come back and give me your excitement over this fight? Obviously, Julia Budd headed to PFL a while ago, and we kind of thought, like, okay, she'll probably be, like, the major kind of challenge for Kayla Harrison. They never made that fight. Now that fight will happen. I mean, yeah. I mean, I think that's exactly why this fight's occurring. They wanted it to happen, and it didn't end up occurring. And now they can just make it. So... There you go. I think it's simple as that. Mm-hmm. For sure, man. For sure. Um, and it is as simple as that. Yeah, I mean, I did go ahead and look it up. They actually did previously schedule these guys. Um, that, um, for, like, PFL, you know, six all the way back in 2021. So these two gals were previously scheduled for back then. So, yeah, I mean, like you mentioned, they one of these two to go ahead and fight in the tournament. didn't happen. Um, I'm excited to see Kayla back, man. I'm very excited to see... How she does, um, because we know that she's beaten Pacheco and she's beaten some good names. Um, but the long layoff, the loss, obviously, and it'll be damn near a year to the date when she last fought, man. So we'll see what happens there. And I believe this will be potentially her last fight in the PFL. Um, I still need to speak to a couple people over there, actually. But I, from what I, from my understanding, she'll be a free agent next year. Um, wow. So, yeah, we will be going through that again. So, potentially, uh, you know, could be her last fight there. But even if it's not, she needs she a big win. She might get that bag. She yeah, might get she, that bag. Yeah, she needs a big win before going to free agency. So, we'll see. Although, I'd, I'd, I'd be surprised if she left, honestly. You know, I'd be very surprised, especially considering, you know, it was either Bellator or BFL, and now PFL is about to own Bellator. So, you know, we'll see. Whatever. Um, anyways, man. We do have some news. This is something that you actually personally want to talk about. This is, this is an angel topic, fellas. Um, so the Baltimore title uh, is expected to be on the line later this year in December. Leon Edwards and Colby Covington are expected to collide. Um, I believe you're using 296 is the is the targeted event, but that's not confirmed. Um, I know Tim Simpson, who represents uh, Leon, recently said the fight should be announced in the next coming you know week or two. But, Angel, the stat is is that the top nine welterweights in the UFC, top nine, all haven't fought in, like, something, like, over in a year. Or, or you know what I mean? Like, something happy along year. those lines. Happy yeah, happy year. Just, yeah. Almost like happy year. But most of them have been, uh, haven't gotten a fight, like, six months plus. There's yeah. only two guys who haven't done that, and that's Sente Luque, one month, obviously, just fought. Uh, Gilbert Burns, four months ago. Bilal Muhammad, four months ago. And those, obviously, those two guys fought each other. But then, you know. Talking about the rest, it's been six months plus. Um, granted, though, some of these you can kind of correlate some stuff to and not to. At the same time, obviously, Sean Brady sidelined by injuries, fights haven't worked out, had to pull out. Uh, Jeff Neal won. I don't know why. Wonder Boy obviously was scheduled to fight. Fight didn't end up happening. Shockbot was supposed to fight Kelvin. Fight did not end up happening. Shamayev did not make weight at welterweight, so he didn't get to fight at welterweight. And he's fighting at 185, so different story there. The the only one on here that I can kind of 
the only one do we have to super question Josh is Colby Covington one year and six months, and he'll be fighting for a title next. Mm. I mean, that's that's a wild stat. I mean, it's something that I think we should have put out there and had people talking about because I feel like with so much talent in this division, and yet people aren't being pushed enough, and we haven't had all these big matchups that we should be getting at welterweight. And I didn't know why, but I didn't realize it was because some of these guys just haven't fought in a while. Mm. Yeah, I mean, I don't even know what to say about it. It's just, it's, it's, it's devastating, dude. I mean, it's so disappointing. This is such a good division with such great talent, and 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 like, look, it all, it all flows downward, right? Um, obviously, the welterweight division sucks now, but like, Angel, how long have we been complaining about the fact that the welterweight division is just continual rehash rematches and the same fucking guys over and over and over again? How long? We, we pretty much the entire show's existence, right? Like. Ever, I mean, ever since the Kamaru title reign where he fought Colby twice and then fought Masvidal twice because they're just such big draws, you know, it's the one thing that makes sense, <laughs> you know. Um, um, and, yeah, man, it's just it's devastating. It's so disappointing. This division has a lot of talent in it. Um, and, and quite frankly, I there's a clear answer here, and it's to just have the, the champions and contenders actually fight, you know what I mean? But whenever you have a division full of divas and the UFC kind of lets this thing fester – this was always going to be the outcome. You know what I mean? Like you have it, you're continually rewarding people like Colby Covington for not fighting. So now, what are the other welterweight contenders going to do? They're not going to take a fight against Jack Della Maddalena. Are you fucking kidding me? <laughs> they're not going to fight that. They're not going to fight some of these young lions that are coming up. They're seeing that Colby, you know, you can do nothing and get rewarded for it. So, um, yeah, man. I mean, it's just it's it's frustrating. I mean, I I don't know what else to say about it other than. What I what I've said about the welterweight division for like a very very long time, and you got you got to give it's credit terrible. to the guys who have like stuck yeah. around and fought, you know, like the Neil Magnes, like the Gilbert Burns, who were trying to be super proactive this year, and the uh, Bilal Muhammad's, you know. Yeah, but then but then they're showing they're showing those guys why they shouldn't do that. You know what I mean? Like it's like congratulations, you know, Neil, you just you stepped in here on short notice against Ian Gary, you know, fucking. Here you go, man. Like, you get, get your ass kicked, and then, you know. I mean, obviously, that was always just how one fight goes. But, like, for example, a guy like you met, you brought him up, Gilbert Burns of the Muhammad. They were told, hey, you guys are a number one contender fight. Whoever gets in here, you guys are fighting for the belt next. But that means nothing because, A, they're not fighting for the belt next. Colby's fighting for the belt next. But they can't get Colby to get in there. Or whatever the issue is here. They can't get Colby and Leon to get in there. So now, what, when is Bill Muhammad going to fight for the title? Next fucking June or something? Like, he's well, already right. he's already been out of the fucking octagon for six months. Or almost six months. It's like, um, it's just, the UFC has, is just, you know, I make jokes about it. And there's the meme, obviously. But, Angel, what has happened to the game I love, you know? Like, <laughs> you they're know? Hurting you. Like, they're hurting you, Josh. They're hurting you. It is hurt, man. The, the welterweight division has always been never the best division. It's never been my own personal favorite. I've always been a lightweight guy. I like middleweight, you know. I'm, I'm a, I like the big boys. I like I like the heavyweights. I like the flyweights, you know. Everybody has their divisions that they kind of like more than others. Welterweight's never been a huge division for me. But at the same time, it is – there's a legacy. There's, there's, there's a history of dominance and a history of just all-time greats. George St. Pierre, Matt Hughes, Robbie Lawler. You know what I mean? Tyron Woodley. Guys like that. And, um, like, Leon. I love Leon. But, like, dude, we're going, we're about to be going on. He's been, he is the second longest reigning male UFC champion, dude. And he's been champion for over a year. You know, one title defense. Still no other fight that's even been announced. So it's just, it's just devastating. It's so disappointing. And I, and I don't really know what to say about it outside of that, man. You know? Um, it's disappointing. It's disappointing, man. I, I just thought it was interesting when I saw the actual numbers and dates and all that. And like I said, some of them, you know, you there's you can correlate specific things too. But it's just like even that man, guys, like Bishop Ahead should have fought a while ago, and obviously, you know, he's going to be fighting on 185 now probably. Uh, and then injuries and, and being sidelined and stuff like that, and guys not getting opportunities, and obviously guys being divas would be like, nope, I'm not going to fight. Whatever it may be, man, at the end of the day, it, it just 
It's just sad to see because I felt like this division has so much potential. It has all these, it has these amazing guys on the come up, and it's just being stagnated at the top. Mm-hmm. And for no reason either. No reason. They, n- nobody's begging for a Colby Covington title shot. Like, like, I mean, we, even he's not even really talking about the fight this morning. He's not even really doing any <laughs> interviews or anything. You know what I mean? Like, Colby does, Colby typically is out there all the time talking to people. He's not. You know what I mean? Um, yeah, it's just, it's a, it's a legacy division for the UC, and they just feel kind of content to just let it, I don't want to say die, but just let it be what it is. A division full of guys who don't like to fight. A division full of guys who their reward are the ones that don't fight. And then now they're sitting around, they're like, guys, why won't you fight? You know, like, it's just, you know, so, um, yeah, just, just so disappointing. Uh, but anyways, that's all we got for that one, man. Uh, because we do have a couple other subjects to discuss, including Tyson Fury and Francis Ngannou. The two heavyweight champions had their first ever press conference <laughs> last week in uh in 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 London, man. Would you uh would you make of it? Tyson I, I saw it, bits man. of it. I didn't see the whole thing. Did you? I saw the whole thing, yeah, man. It oh was, my god. So go into it a little bit. Let me see what I can draw it out of it. It was it was weird. That's all I can, it was weird. You know, like um it's a, it's a lot of Tyson talking and Francis just being there, right? I think but that's Francis, like, yeah. it's like Francis MO though. Yeah, Francis isn't a huge talker, and Tyson said, you know, he'd fight him in MMA, but I did find it interesting that he pretty much said, like, he he didn't, like, he even outwardly said it. They asked him on, like, the, before the press conference even started, they asked him, like, on, like, the red the red carpet thingy, like, the grand arrivals or whatever they call it, um, you know, what, he, what he's kind of doing next. He's like, yeah, I'll fight, I'll fight Ngannou here, I'll fight Ngannou in MMA, I'll fight John Jones in boxing, I'll fight John Jones in MMA, you know, I don't really care about all these contenders, you know, I got the name, they don't. You know, uh, I, I'm going to do whatever I want. So it's like, he, I just imagine the accent too, dude, which makes it even better. Yeah. I mean, it was, it was interesting though. Cause he outwardly said, they were asking like, okay, not even just you say, what about the, about these other contenders? You know, what, what about, you know, Zelly Zhang, you know, what, what about fucking, you know, um, Andy Ruiz or any of He's like, you know, I don't care about him. I'm done. I, I said, I came back to boxing to get a bag and that's all I'm doing. I don't care, you know. It's like, damn, man. This just damn. Hey, at least yeah. he made it clear, right? Yeah, that's true. That is true. No BSing uh, around. Yeah. I mean, for, as far as the, the what you did see from from the uh the press conference, what do you think of it, man? Um funny, I, dude. it's always funny, let's be honest. Yeah, it is. It is. Um but of of the subject, and ultimately, what did it kind of make you think about like ahead of the the fight, man? It was definitely interesting seeing the vibe of Fury because I thought he did not look like Tyson Fury that we knew for a long time with the Wilder fight. This reminded me, and I hate to say it, of the like pre Klitschko Fury. Like he seemed very wild, very all over yes. the place. Yeah, yeah, a little erratic. Yeah, no, I can agree with that. That's what I'm saying. That's what I thought it was yeah. funny. Oh, okay, I see what you're saying. Okay, yeah. Uh, and Francis is, like I tell you, Francis is a meter, I feel like it never changes. He's just, he is like, uh, what's the word? Like the, the, the professional, you know, other, pro, always professional, super just respectful, super just present, well dressed, uh, you know, well spoken, not a lot of jokes, super serious, never ever changing, very killer like, you know? Yeah. Uh, and like kind of what you expect the utmost professional athlete could be. Um, so that, that's kind of the way I thought. Fair enough, man. Yeah, that's it. I don't have a whole lot to say here. Um, yeah, it, it is what it is. Uh, definitely uh, an entertaining, entertaining night. And we're le- and we're only about a month away, a month and a half away from the fighting angels. So that's pretty crazy to think about. Um, this is going to be a fun discussion. This this next one. Uh, Alexander Volkanovsky was interviewed the night of UFC 293. He did pest comments, and he said he said he wants two things. He wants Ilya Tapuria. He wants him very soon. He wants to be active. That's his point. He said he wants to be active this year. He said that multiple times. He said it all year long. He also wants Islam Makachev. He wants the main event Islam uh, main event UC 300 against Islam Makachev. We talked about fight, fight, Josh. That's what he wants to do. He wants his, he wants his fucking money, you know, and not a more Yeah, he wants his motherfucking money, man. Yeah, I mean, we talked about UC 300 in the past about. Who could potentially headline it? I know Connor, Connor McGregor, McGregor said he's wanting to do it. Izzy said he wanted to do it. 
Volkanovski said he Put them all on, Josh. Out. Put them all on. God damn it. You know, put them all on. Realistically, they're not going to put them all on. So I think, I mean. They fucking should, though. They fucking should. Realistically, Volkanovski versus Makachev 2, headliner UFC 300. That, that probably is near the top of their list, honestly, dude. Like, what do you think about that as a potential UFC 300 main event? Not co-main, main event. I mean, looking at the landscape, Josh, like, of everybody, and as far as names, power, views, I mean, it probably is that fight. I mean, who else are you going to put there, you know? Obviously, Izzy not being champ right now. Obviously, there is, obviously, with Sean and all that, if you decide to go that way, you could put that on there. Um, but I feel like, as far as a fight, interest, you know, bringing in the views, I mean, Islam, if, if things go the way that, you know, if, if Islam does beat Charles, or if Charles beats his, you know, whatever ends up happening, right? Mm-hmm. I mean, that, I don't know. Uh, fuck, dude. Would, would you be still interested? Let's say hypothetically Charles beats Islam. Would you still be interested in a, a Charles uh, Volkanovski fight, or would you rather see a, a, still a rematch even if Islam's coming off a loss? I think if, the, I think if Charles beats Volkanovski, you got to do a trilogy. Oh, shit. You're right. You in three UFC? Three, oh, I, mean, I love you, Jack. I didn't even, man. Okay. You didn't even think about that, did you? UFC 300? No. If, if, if Olivera beats Makachev, a trilogy? Co-main event. Volkanovski to Pura. Easy. If it ends up going like that, right? Obviously, that's a whole other topic for discussion. Obviously, that fight still needs to play out. But, no, I mean, I think I think no matter what, you're going to have Volk in that event, right? Whether it's him in the main event at one four, on what at 155 or him in the co-main event or main event at 145. Probably co-main if he's fighting 145, I'll just assume. Mm-hmm. Yeah, yeah, probably. Um... I mean, he's a pound. He's pound for pound the best in, in in the whole UFC right now. I mean, there's no question about him. Yeah. Um, he was like, George Jones is here, dude. Yeah, right. Um, dude, it is going to be interesting though. Like, like we talked about this briefly. Like, we've kind of done like the 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 math. Like the math. I've done the math in my head multiple times anyway. In terms of like who could headline it and like timing wise, because it's like, you know. It's not going to be Izzy, I don't think, unless they want to do Izzy, Izzy versus Sean Strickland headlining UFC 300, at which point, like, fuck, you know? Like, it's just. I mean, they could potentially do three title fights, Josh. I, mean, I really. I, I Here's what I honestly thought they were going to do. If I thought if Izzy won, I thought they probably would have done Izzy, Drikas, Volk, Makachev 2, and then maybe a third title fight. I don't know who. Pantoja, Pantoja, Royval. Pantoja, Royval, maybe, yeah. And then they would just because you know it. the other one's gonna be kind of a, not to be just kind of a throwaway. You know, it'd be like one thirty five men. Yeah, yeah. Like it's like it's like how oh, you know. well for UC two hundred they have. Well, not one, well, not one thirty five. My bad, because Sean's champ now, so they'll definitely want to maximize his value. But it'll probably be men's flyweight or women's strawweight potentially as a third out there as a title fight. Yeah, I mean for UC two hundred they had obviously it was supposed to be. John DC, uh, which obviously turned into DC Anderson Silva still, but you know, um, which was a major title fight. They had Misha Tate Amanda Nunes major title fight, and then they had interim title, you know, Aldo Edgar too, which you know was flying under the radar. So I assume they'll probably have a similar case here: two major title fights, and then a third one that kind of you know kind of just lurked below. Which which perfectly um, is Pantoja Royval when you're thinking about it. Exactly, and Roy Val, you know, already said uh, he already hinted that they're they're in the works. So we'll see. Yeah. Um. Yeah, man. I mean, I I, I think it'd be interesting. I think a mock a Makachev, you know, uh, Volkanovski rematch headlining UFC two three hundred would be absolutely insane. I think it just depends on if that's what they're deciding to go ahead and do. I think it obviously depends on how a Taporia fight would go as well. And obviously, Makachev still needs to fight Oliveira and so on and so forth. But, uh, dude, we're fine. He's, he's a couple. There's only been a couple of guys that have already called for it. So we'll see how it goes. I don't think they're going to do somebody like McGregor, though. I don't think they're going to do Connor. I know Connor called for it. There's no way they're going to they're gonna put that in his hands, especially with the USADA situation, I don't think. But uh, that's just my thoughts, man. Um, I think we should go ahead and move on because we have one last topic, man. We talked about it briefly to end the show last week. We kind of previewed it a little bit. God damn, dude. Junior Dos Santos. And TRT Fabricio... is wonderful, god damn it. Huh? The TRT is wonderful. Oh, dude, yeah. The TRT is wonderful. The TRT was incredible because in the main event, 
the TRT was a wonderful TRT was plentiful in the main event of Game Bread FC5, man. Fabrizio Verdum and Junior Dos Santos nearly killing each other. Fabrizio Verdum's fucking eyelid looked like it was going to fall off. I mean, in the end, JDF picks up the win by split decision. Um, I don't see how it was a split. What do you think about right? this fight, man? Uh, it was crazy. It was everything I wanted it to be. It was exactly what I wanted it to be. I'm on the same page. Like, I think these guys maximized what they had. <laughs> yeah. They really, really did, dude. And and full credit to him, dude. Full fucking credit to him. Look, I'll, I'll admit it. I only watched the main event, by the way. I'm sorry to cut you off there, but I just, I just want to clarify that. I was only there for the main event. <laughs> oh, so was I. Yeah, same. <laughs> I mean, I saw some of the prelims, but I didn't really, you know, care that much. Um, yeah, man. Just just an absolutely absurd fight. Absolute banger. Happy to see JDS pick up a win. Um, and they also said that Jorge said the winner of this is going to fight the winner of Roy Nelson versus Alan Belcher, which is going to happen next month. So, what the fuck? That, that's so random. It is random. And apparently those, the winner of those two fights will fight for the game-bred bare-knuckle MMA title. So, yeah, we'll see, man. We will see. Um, nonetheless, it was a pretty entertaining night. And hope you guys enjoyed the podcast overall, man. Um, that's all we got for this week. Hope you guys enjoyed. I'm at Josh Evanoff on Twitter. He's at Angel Ortega on Twitter 01. I quartzite sound for all things relating to the show. Peace and butt grease. Mouse click.